there's, there's going to be three factor problems. So I'm going to say, hey, here's 10 centimeters at 50 degrees, and this is some other ones, and that's the one where you're going to take a protractor and a ruler, okay, and you're going to draw these out, tip to tail, graphical method, okay? That's going to be the first thing that's going to happen. That'll be the first vector problem. The second vector problem, I'm going to give you a single vector, just like what's happening on question number four. I'm going to say, okay, hey, here's a launch velocity of, I don't know, 50 meters per second at 40 degrees. And you're going to have to find the X and Y components of that, okay? That's going to be the second problem. So on that one, just realize that I'm asking you to do this big fancy thing. This says deconstruct the vector, which is basically find the X and Y components. So you have to know your trig functions. So, and, and again, don't memorize these, okay? Because you're gonna have that big dot equation sheet and it's gonna have sine, cosine, tangent that are on the sheet. You don't have to memorize them. The Pythagorean theorem is gonna be there. You just have to know how to use it. So, tangent, come on. So, Remember, this is going to be your y component. That's going to be your x. It's just like an x and y axis. Here's x, here's the y. So since your y component is going to be the side opposite that angle, your y component will always be the vector times the sine of the angle, and your x component will always be the vector times the cosine of the angle. Okay, that's it. Just make sure that your calculators are in degree mode and not in radian mode when you're on bless you, when you're on the test. Okay, just make that's the biggest thing because if you get in weird numbers that don't make any sense, oddly enough, you're probably going to be in radian mode and not degree mode. So again, this is not those equations are not explicitly given to you on the equation sheet. You just have to know how to use your trig functions. Go, oh, here's my y component, here's my x component, okay? Cosine, sine, there you go. So that's gonna be the second problem. If you want to, I would encourage you to make a sketch on that problem so you can see where everything is, but you're not going to actually draw that out with and measure it with, with a ruler and protractor. You're gonna use trig functions on that. And I will tell you explicitly, use trig functions, okay? The third problem that you're going to have is going to be something like here on number five, where you have, where you're going to add two vectors together and you have to draw the chart and find the X and Y components. So I want to make sure everybody's cool with that. So if you look down here on, like for example, on number five, where you're going to add vector B plus vector B, okay? This is what I would do. And I've done a lot of these longer than you all have been on this earth. And literally, if you gave, this is, this is the exact sequence that I would do. If you said, okay, work camp, here's your vector problem. You need to add vector B plus vector B. This is the first thing I would do. I want to look at vector B and go, okay, hey, that's 5.75 at 90 degrees. I'm just going to make a sketch and go, okay, here's vector B pointing up straight up at 90 degrees. And then I've got vector E, 8.78 newtons at 110. And so there's 90, so there's 110, so there's vector E. So I draw it like this. So this is what we call this free body diagram. That's going to give me an idea of where this is going to happen. So at this point, I know this is 90 degrees here. And I know this angle here was 110 degrees. So think about this, okay? So... Izzy is kicking the ball this way straight up at 90 degrees. Alexis is kicking the ball this way at 110 degrees. Where's the ball going to go? What does that angle have to be between? 90 and 110. Okay? That ball is going to go somewhere in this path. So that way, when I get my angle... I can look, hey, is my angle somewhere between 90 and 110? If it's not, then I've done something wrong. So what that sketch gives you at least an idea of where it's going to go. Now, some people like to do this. Here's another option. They'll draw it tip to tail. They'll go, okay, here's vector B. 
And then from the end of that, they're going to draw vector E, and then they're going to go, oh, here's going to be my resultant. If you draw it that way, again, all that does is reinforce the idea that that angle has to be more than 90 degrees. Okay, that's what it tells you. You don't stop mandatory that you do those, but here's some advice. The more different ways you can analyze a complex problem, the more likely that you are to be successful when you solve it. It's like, okay, hey, does this make sense? Does my angle end up where I want to be? Now, here's the next critical thing that you have to do. And I'm going to tell you right now on the test, if you don't draw this chart, bad things are going to happen. Here's your X, here's your Y, boom, here's vector B, here's vector E, here's going to be the sum. So on this one, hopefully this is what you see as your X components. You have 0 and you have 5.75 because all of that's acting in the y, y direction there. You have nothing in the X. And then that E should be negative 3 and... 8.25, okay? So that's what you should have already calculated up above. Go through, add these together. You get negative 3 and then 14.0, okay? So all I did was just add those numbers together. So here's the most critical step that you have to do, okay? I cannot emphasize this enough. Here's the most critical step that you have to do is that once you get those drawn, then go out and sketch this triangle so that you know which quadrant that you're in. Are you in the first, second, third, fourth, okay? And always draw your X component first. So come out here and go, okay, my X component is gonna be negative three, so that's gonna be negative three newtons. And then my Y component is going to be 14 newtons, and then I'm going to draw that result. Now, if, if it were me, if it were me, this is what I would do. I know I need this angle, okay, if that's what I'm after. So, again, this sketch reinforces the idea that my angle is going to be more than 90 degrees. Okay, hey, that's kind of where I want to end up. I've got a negative y and a positive, or there's negative x and a positive y. Oh, I'm in that second quadrant. I'm cool so far. It's, it's looking good, okay? What I would do, what I would do, I would just use inverse tangent of 14 over 3. I wouldn't even punch in that negative value, okay? I wouldn't. I wouldn't even mess with it. It's like, okay, I can handle this. I would just find that angle. That's it. But then I would realize, oh, that angle has to be from that positive x axis, and then I would subtract that from 180 degrees, okay? So I would find that angle. Don't even mess with the negative sign and then I would subtract that from 180. Now, but if you go, oh, Mr. Burkamp, oh, I like negative signs. I just, you know, I like negative signs. So you could punch in the inverse tangent of 14 over negative 3. Here's what your calculator is going to tell you. Your calculator is going to give you a negative angle. Okay, this is what your calculator is going to tell you. Your calculator is going to tell you it's a negative angle. And then you go, wow, what do I do with a negative angle? Because your angles can't be negative. So then you'd have to realize, oh, I still have to add that to 180. But here is the biggest thing, okay? Here's the biggest thing, is that when you make that sketch, that's going to allow you to have a visual reference in terms of where that angle is going to be. So your angle on B plus E should be about 102 degrees, okay? So if you did that right, you should end up at about 102 degrees, okay? So that's what I would do, okay? This me. So when you do C plus F, so again, here's what's critical when you do C plus F. If you just make this sketch, 
So here are two acceleration vectors. So C is 4.76 and 195 degrees. Okay, so here's my vector C. And then I've got F, which is over here at 350 degrees. Okay, so here's 195. Here is all the way around to 350 degrees. So these are two acceleration vectors. So maybe this is a situation where uh, an object is being pulled by two ropes. And this is the acceleration that each one could cause. And we're just trying to find the net acceleration. But again, here's what's critical about this is you, if you draw it as a free body diagram. You know that that vector is going to end up somewhere pointing downwards. Okay? So when you know, when you get this angle, it has to be somewhere between 195 and 350. Okay, that's where your angle has to be. It has to be somewhere between those two points. And that's the advantage of making this sketch. So, if all goes well when you do C plus F, what you should see is that your X components are going to be negative 2.14. There's your sum of your X. And the sum of your Y components should be negative 1.66. So if you do this right, that's what should be the sum of those values. So here's the deal. And again, this is why you make a sketch. Oh, I've got an X component that's negative 2.14. So I'm going to come over negative 2.14. I got a negative Y component. So I'm going to come down here, negative 1.66. Boom. Use the Pythagorean theorem to find that resultant. And again, what I would do I would just find this angle, wouldn't even punch in the negative signs. I'd just find this angle and add that to 180. So on that one where you have C plus F, that angle should be around 220 degrees. Okay? Which again matches with what we said should happen. Uh, on number six, your. Uh, the vector itself, the magnitude, should be around 15, and the angle should be around 75. Okay, so give some idea if that's right. And then on number 7, that vector should be around 10 newtons, and the angle should be around 175 degrees. So on number 6, the angle is around 75, on number seven, the angle was around 175. Okay. Any questions you want me to go over on that? If you want to hold on to this assignment, because this is kind of kind of the most complex steps, and use that and hand that assignment in on Monday, that's cool. If you just want to done with it and want to get it handed in, that's cool too. So whatever works for you. Okay. Okay, so let's say hypothetically, on the test on Monday, 
I'm going to give you a position time graph that looks like that. Okay? Random draw. So, what? tell me one thing that you can figure out from that position time graph. Connor, tell me one thing you can look at that and go, oh, this is, I know what happens. Uh, it changes directions a couple of times. How do you know? Because the velocity goes to zero and then changes sign. Okay. Now, that's something very important that Connor said. Just because an object stops doesn't mean that it changes direction. Okay? So if you're driving north on Mays Road and you stop at like 29th Street, that doesn't mean that your car changes direction. Okay? So if you're in change direction, you do have to slow down, stop, and then you have to speed back up. But just because you stop doesn't mean that you change direction. But you can't change the direction without stopping. Okay? So it's like a logic problem. Okay, so Connor, tell me how many times does this thing change direction? Four times. Where at? Um, Where would you look if you if someone walks in this room and says, "Man, that's the position time graph." What can you conclude? And you go, "Hey, it changed the direction four times." I said, "How do you know?" I think in the room the beat, man. It's like he's got a good beat. I can dance to it. I literally deleted that one. I don't even know why. <laughs> it has a mind of its own. <laughs> it is a smartphone. So there you go. It's like AI is rude. It's like, no, you can't shut me off. I'm gonna go off anyway. Okay. So <laughs> before we were interrupted with the room the beat. So how can you tell that it changed direction four times? What would you look for? Uh, where the slope uh, goes to zero. Okay, and that would be obviously here, right? So there's one. But how can you tell that the slope goes to zero down below? It doesn't ever look like it really goes to zero. I can draw tangent lines. Ah, the slope of a tangent line can go to zero. Okay, so if I come in here and go, okay, hey, there's one, there's another one, there's another one. So if you can draw a tangent line that has a slope of zero, you're going to change direction. So I've got one, two, three, four direction changes. Okay? That's cool. <sighs> Peyton, at the beginning, from like that first interval up to about three seconds, is the object speeding up or slowing down? How do you know? It's getting farther away from the image. Yeah. Mm. The slope's going up. There you go. Okay. Because, it, it, again, what does the slope of a position time graph give you? Velocity. Velocity. So if the slope is becoming steeper, the object is going faster. Okay. So now here's another thing that's going to happen. I promise you. I promise you. You have a graph like this, and I'm going to say, hey, what's the instantaneous velocity at a particular point in time? Okay, I'm going to say one second. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the time. Okay, I promise you this is going to happen. I promise you, you mark my words. It's even going to be on the back of the front page. Okay, it's going to involve a small woodland creature named Chuck. Okay, and I'm going to say, what's Chuck's velocity at a particular point in time? And I'm going to, like, for example, that's like this one I say one second. So if I want to figure out what's the velocity at one second, what are you going to have to draw? Tangent line, right? You don't have to draw. If you had in your test and you have not taken a ruler and you said, oh, here's at one second, and you're just going to have to ballpark it and go, okay, if you want to visualize this as being like the radius of the circle, and then I'm going to draw that at one second. I screwed that up. So that's going to be just like this. So at one second, you're going to come up here where that's going to cross at that one second mark. Get rid of that. And you're going to draw that tangent line, take a ruler. Oh, seriously? Come back here. 
and you're gonna lay that over that just like this, boom, and you're gonna try canceling. Okay? If you hand in your test Monday and you have not done what I've just done, taken a ruler, drawn tangent line, stop. You have done something wrong. I promise you, you're gonna to have to do this. So, when you do this, how are you actually gonna find the slope of the line? What are you gonna to have to do? How are you gonna find the slope of the line? What do you have to have? How many points? Two. Two. So, this might be, this might be one of them. This might be one of them. Do you think I'm going to expect you to show your work on how you found the slope of that line? Yeah. Categorically, yes. Now, since this line is sloping up and to the right, is that slope going to be a positive or negative value? Positive. Positive. So you know I sh I'm going to have to end up with the positive slope. So help me. If you hand in that test and you have not done that, and put two points on that line, found the slope, Stop. Don't hit it in. Ah, oh, work him. Ah. Pin on the tangent line. Okay? I promise you you're gonna have to do that. Okay. So here's the whole point. And let's go back to what Peyton said. So I know this thing is speeding up because of the fact that if I go a little bit farther and draw another tangent line, that line is becoming steeper. So if you look at like a football curve on a position time graph. Okay, A, B, C. So, which one shows constant velocity? Hector, which one shows constant velocity? That's right, because that's straight sloping line, right? Slope isn't changing, velocity isn't changing. So here's my question. B shows constant velocity. So how does, how would B Stay with me here. How would B be represented on a velocity time graph? So B shows constant velocity. So how would that show up on a velocity time graph? Devin. It'd be a straight line. Doing what? Sloping up, sloping down, horizontal, at zero meters per second. Where would it be? It would just say be flat, right? At zero or above zero? Uh, above zero. So maybe something like this? Yes. So if the slope of that line, let's say, was five meters per second, that would be represented as a horizontal line on a velocity time graph. So constant, and you have to know where the, how this looks. Constant velocity on a position time graph is a straight sloping line. Constant velocity on a velocity time graph is a horizontal line. Okay? It's cool. Now, Peyton, what is C doing? Speeding up or slowing down? Speeding up. And because you know that because the slope is increasing. So how could I show increasing velocity on a velocity time graph? Huh? Now, would it be a curved line, or would it be a straight sloping line? It'd be curved. Straight sloping. And here's the reason why, okay? It's, a, it's, a tech, it's more of a technical thing. But on a velocity time graph, we are always going to have a straight sloping line because that shows uniform acceleration. So a straight sloping line on a velocity time graph is what we call uniform acceleration. And the reason that we have uniform acceleration is because of that big sign in the back that says F equals MA. So we want a constant force producing a, a uniform acceleration. So if I said, hey, here's C, pick the line on the velocity time graph that matches with that, I promise you on any velocity time graph, any segment is always going to be some straight sloping line, okay? Always going to be that. All right. So, what's happening on A? Derek, what's happening on A? What am I doing? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Got straight 
straight sloping line, you have you're increasing your velocity, so you're yep. accelerating. No, no, a. A. This line. This oh. line here. Is that curving right there? It is. And that's a. Uh, so you are. That precision time graph, yes, it is. Yes, it okay, is. Okay, so you are your velocity is mellowing out. Okay, because that that slope is becoming more and more shallow, so it's becoming less and less steep. So a would show up on a velocity time graph something like this. Okay, where I have some positive velocity and it's slowing down. Here's the velocity time graph. And I do something like this. Okay? This is my velocity time graph. Here's zero meters per second. Derek, did that object change direction? Yes. How do you know? Uh, you can draw a horizontal line, or like a tangent line, and then see if the slope is zero at the top of the curve. Yeah. My bad. Uh, the slope changes sign. Wait, no, it doesn't change. Wait, you said it changes direction. Does the object change direction? No. Why? Because it doesn't go past zero meters per second. Fantastic. Okay. If the slope of a velocity time graph changes sign, that doesn't mean that you change direction. Okay? So all that's happening here is that I'm starting, I have some positive velocity, I'm speeding up, and then I just start slowing down. Okay, so if the slope of a velocity time graph changes sign, that doesn't mean that you change direction. All that happens is that I change the acceleration. I went from positive acceleration to negative acceleration. Okay, because here's the criteria. Here's the criteria. To change direction, what well, three things have to happen? You got to slow, slow down. Go through zero. Go through zero. Speed back up. The only thing that happens here is that I meet one of the criteria. Okay, I only meet one of the criteria. All I do from here is I go from like five meters per second to ten meters per second, back to five meters per second. Okay, I did not change direction. The only thing I did was slow down. Okay, now how could I show this thing changing direction? A daughter, what would I have to do to show it changing direction? Go through zero. Yeah, I'd have to go through zero meters per second like that. Then I would change the direction. Okay? So this, no change in direction. Crosses through zero, then I change the direction. Based upon that graph. So let me redraw that without all the random arrows pointing to the fact that it's a velocity time graph. Okay? So let's start with that. This is a velocity time graph. I say again, it's a velocity time graph. Did I start at the reference point? Did I start with a positive position from reference point? Did I start with a negative position relative to the reference point? Or you can't tell. Is it? You can't tell. I can't tell. I can't tell. The only thing I know is that I have a positive velocity, and I speed up, and then I slow down. So velocity is a vector quantity. Okay, so if you let like this banjo represent the, the vector, okay? And so let's say that the can of scrubbing bubbles is the reference point, okay? So if you consider the, the amount of banjo that's sticking out to be the vector quantity. So the only thing I know is that I start with, or 
of attitude, some amount of positive velocity, okay? So I'm gonna start here, and that velocity vector is gonna get bigger, and then that velocity vector is gonna get smaller, okay? That's all I know. I don't know where I am. All I know is that I'm going in a direction. So I could be over here, okay, I could be way over here, and do this, and then slow down. I can start at the reference point, start here, speed up, slow down. I could be in St. Louis, Missouri, and do the same thing, and you couldn't tell. So you can't tell positions on a velocity time graph. The only thing that you can tell is that you have a positive velocity. You cannot tell where you are on a velocity time graph. Now, let's say, let's say, I give you velocity time graph that looks like this. And let's say that's uh, five meters per second for 10 seconds, okay? So your velocity time graph. What's the object doing? Speeding up, slowing down, or moving at a constant velocity? Constant. constant velocity, how do you know? Jack, how do you know? It's a uh, straight line. Straight horizontal line, right? Constant velocity. What's my acceleration, Jack? Uh, acceleration is zero meters per second. Zero meters per second squared. I have a constant velocity, right? There you go. So, could I find that area on that graph? What would that represent? Displacement. Displacement, okay? So I could take five meters per second times 10 seconds, and I would get 50 meters. So remember, the area underneath a velocity time graph gives you displacement. Now, if that had been a position time graph, if that had been a position time graph, I can still take five times 10 and I can still get 50, but what units would I have? Meters. Meter seconds, right? Meters times seconds, I'd have 50 meter seconds. What is measured in meter seconds? Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. So the meaning the area underneath a position time graph has no meaning because the units don't mean anything. You can find the area, but it's just like, well, what's the point? Because you're just going to get meters seconds. So on a velocity time graph, the area represents displacement. On a position time graph, the area doesn't mean anything. Okay. So I promise you, here's another type of problem that you're going to have. Oh. Uh, Angel, pick a number between 40 and 60. Pick a number. 52. 52. All right, so you have the carrot car, and it's traveling at 52 kilometers per hour. Okay? Here's the carrot car. Boom. Moving 52 kilometers per hour. And let's say that you are going to travel... Uh, Jaden, pick a number between 100 and 150. 147. 147. Oh, really? 147 meters. Okay? So here's, I promise you, you're going to have a problem like this. You mark my words. Carrot car is traveling at 52 kilometers per hour. It's going to travel 147 meters. I want to know how long that's going to take in seconds. Okay? Promise you. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. You're going to have a problem like this. Back of the last page. It's going to be the last set of problems you're going to do. Something like this. Now, let's start with the obvious. This is in meters. That's in kilometers per hour. What are you going to have to do with the kilometers per hour? Convert it into meters per second. If you hand in that test on Monday and you have not converted a number from kilometers per hour into meters per second, you have done something wrong. Okay, I promise you, you're going to have to do that. So let's make sure everybody's cool with this. You have 50.0 kilometers per one hour. 
One kilometer is 1,000 meters. One hour is 3,600 seconds. If you don't really want to get cute, you can lop off the zeros. The short version of this story is that you multiply by 10 and you divide by 36. Okay? That's the short version. And when you do this, remember, your answer in meters per second is always going to be numerically smaller than your value in kilometers per hour because you're multiplying by 10 and you're dividing by 36. If you do this conversion and you get a number bigger than what you started, you have done something horribly wrong. Okay? So, somebody do the conversion. Multiply, multiply by 10, divide by 36. What do you get? 520 divided by 36. What do you get? 14.4. 14 14.4? 14 yes. Okay. Meters per second. Now, notice that 52.0 has how many significant digits? Three. Three. Therefore, I have to have at least three significant digits here. Don't round that to 14. Bad things are going to happen. You keep at least the same number of digits there. Now, what I'm going to do next is wrong. Okay? Do not do what I'm about to do. It's wrong. Okay? It's wrong. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go, oh, okay, right. Ah, i got to get meters to cancel out. Burkamp has talked to us about units. Oh, what can I do? Oh, I'll do this. I'll take 147 meters, and uh, I got that number, and then I got meters per second. I want the meters, I want the, uh, meters to cancel out. So I'll take 14.4 uh, meters per second and divide that by 147 meters. Uh, the meters will cancel out, uh, and then I get seconds. Okay? All right? Is everybody cool with that? No, stop. Go, Mr. Burkamp, that's wrong. It's wrong, Mr. Burkamp, stop. Here's the deal. Do you get seconds? No. What units do you get? You get one over seconds, okay? You can't look at this and go, oh, the meters cancel out. I get seconds. What's the big deal? Burkamp, God, chill out, man. No. Because if you do this operation, you're taking meters per second. You're dividing by meters. So that's like multiplying by the reciprocal. So you actually get one over seconds. Okay? You don't get units of time. You don't get seconds. You get one over seconds. And there's a huge difference between seconds and one over seconds. Now, humor me. Jay, humor me. Let's say I did this wrong. I want you to take 14.4 and divide that by 147. And let me know what you get. This is wrong. I don't want you to do this, but I'm going to make a point with it. Okay, what did you get? 0 0.0979. 979, okay. And you're going to go, oh, 0 0.0979 seconds, okay. And, and you're going to feel good about life, okay. You're going to feel good. Go, God. Okay? Now let's think about this for just a second. And again, the more ways that you can analyze a problem, the better off you're going to be. So let's go to this. This is a rate function. It's a rate function. That says that I'm traveling 14.4 meters per one second. Okay? So if I drive one second, I'm going to travel 14.4 meters, which is about the length of this room, okay? So in every second that goes by, your car is going to travel about the length of this room. Ballpark, okay? Kind of gives you a visual. Now, here's the story. You want to travel 147 meters, okay? So think this through. If I'm traveling 14.4 meters per one second, and I need to travel 147 meters, is my time going to be bigger or smaller than one second? <clears throat> bigger. Because I'm traveling 14.4 meters in just one second. I have to travel more than 14.4 meters. Therefore, I know my time 
has to be more than one second. That's why if you did that wrong and you looked at that, you would have gone, whoa, this is bad. I know my answer has to be more than 14.4. So if I get that answer, I know I've done something wrong. Okay? So there's two reasons why that isn't going to work. Number one, mathematically, it doesn't make any sense. Okay? It makes no sense at all because the answer has to be more than one second. From a unit's perspective, it's a train wreck because you get one over seconds. Okay? So there's three ways that you can work this problem. There's three different ways. Count them three. Okay? I feel like an info motion. But wait, there's a one way to work it. No, there's three. For added shipping and handling, I will show you how to work all this problem three different ways. So while we're on the proportion, it's like Mr. Burkham, I like proportions. Proportions are cool, okay? Don't get me wrong, proportions are cool. So you can sit there and go, oh, I got 14.4 meters per one second. That's going to equal 147 meters over X number of seconds. Set it up as a proportion. Cross multiply. Take 147 meters. Cross multiply times one second is going to equal 14.4 meters times x seconds. I divide both sides by 14.4. My meters cancel out. I'm left with units of seconds. Boom. There's my answer. Okay? So if you like proportions, Mr. Burkamp, I was president of the proportion club when I was in high school. Good for you. Okay, you probably didn't go to prom, but you were president of the proportion club. Okay? And you can work it that way. And if you like that, cool. Go with it. It works. It's beautiful. Okay? But you go, ah, Miss Brookham. I'm a formula kind of person. I like formulas. Good. Well, you know the distance traveled equals velocity times time. There you go. You know your distance is. 147 meters, you have that. You have your velocity of 14.4 meters per second. You need to solve for time. Oh, okay, great. I can take distance and divide it by velocity and get time. This works. You can take 147 meters and divide that by 14.4 meters per second. Now, this is where the magic happens. Ah, oh, right. That's meters times the reciprocal of meters per second, which is seconds over meters. The meters cancel out. I get seconds. It's beautiful. Works. It's cool. It also makes sense mathematically. Oh, I'm taking 147 and dividing it by 14.4. I'm going to get an answer bigger than 1 because I have to get an answer bigger than 1 because the distance that I'm traveling is bigger than 14.4 meters. Okay. Cool. That's your second option. You're a formula kind of person. Third option. It's like, oh, this is Brookham. I love areas. I love rectangles. I, I, I like geometry. Okay, you can work it as a geometry problem. Here's a velocity time graph. Come along here and go, okay, that's 14.4 meters per second. That's the height of my rectangle, is 14.4 meters per second. That's the height of my rectangle. I know the area of the rectangle is 147 meters. That's, that's what that represents because it's a velocity time graph, so the area is my displacement. What I don't know is time. I don't know the base of the rectangle. So you can sit there and go, oh, area of a rectangle is length times width. Area of the rectangle is 147 meters. The length is my time, which is what I don't know. The width is 14.4 meters per second. I divide it over, boom, there we go. Okay? I don't care how you solve the problem. It literally, I don't care. Okay? But what I would recommend is that when you get an answer, that you solve it in different methods. Okay, verify your answer. So, I don't care what you do, just look at it in different ways. 
Um, let me see what the other big thing is on the, be on the test. A uh, lot of questions on position time graphs, velocity time graphs, uh, displacement. You're going to have a question like this where you're going to have, it, it literally, if you don't solve for, if you don't follow, if you don't solve for a time or something like that on a distance velocity question, you've done something wrong. That's going to be the three vector problems. One where you draw it out, one where you just find the components, and one where you draw the big chart. Those are going to be those two. All right, so what I have for your review. Yes. Okay. So, the yellow sheet is the basic idea of here are questions very similar to what you're going to see on the test, okay? So, like, for example, here's this position time graph, okay? So, one of the things that you should be able to do on a position time graph is calculate what we call average velocity. So if you go way back up here to where we started with this position time graph, okay? So if you remember, average velocity is your overall position final minus your position initial. So when I ask you to calculate average velocity, which I will, okay, which I will, you take your overall final position minus your initial position and divide that by time. So if I said, hey, what's the average velocity through three seconds? Okay, I'd pick a time. So your average velocity is going to be your overall final position, which in this case would be like six meters. That's where I ended up. My initial position was two. It wasn't zero. I didn't start at zero. I started at two. So what I would do to find that average velocity for these first three seconds, my final position is six meters. My initial position was two meters. That took three seconds. I would get one and a third meters per second. Okay? So when I ask you to calculate average velocity, which I will, okay, take your overall final minus your initial Divide that by however much time that took, okay? You have to do that. There's going to be questions on that cart lab that you all did where you push the cart and it hit the wall and it bounced back. Make sure that you look over that. So let's say that I gave you uh, just randomly drawing a velocity time graph. Uh, let's say you had something like this, okay? So here's this velocity time graph. If I ask you to count or determine the area when it has its biggest acceleration, how would you look at the velocity time graph and find the region of biggest acceleration? What would you look for? Graphically, what would you look for? A shallow slope or a steep slope? You want big acceleration. What would you do? Shallow, steep? Steep. Because the slope of a velocity time graph gives you acceleration. So, and remember when I ask you about acceleration on the test. Okay, and I'm going to ask you a lot about acceleration. Get out of your mind that, oh, acceleration just means that you're speeding up. Okay? Acceleration can mean that I'm speeding up, but acceleration can also be slowing down. So when I talk about acceleration in the confines of this class, acceleration is one of three things. Either your velocity vector is getting bigger and you're speeding up, your velocity vector is getting smaller and you're slowing down, or you're changing the direction of your velocity vectors. We haven't gotten any, gotten any changing directions yet, so acceleration only means that you're speeding up or slowing down, okay? So, if I said find the steepest line, that's going to represent the biggest acceleration. So this is when you're going to have your largest acceleration. Right there, steepest line. Boom, there you go. Here's zero meters per second. So, 
I'm going to have the same acceleration the entire time because it's the same slope from here to here. So this acceleration from here to here is the same because the slope is the same. But from here to here, this region right here, this little bit right here, right there, am I speeding up or slowing down from here to here? What am I doing? Slowing down. Slowing down. How do you know? There's two ways you can answer it. Number one is that I'm approaching zero meters per second. So I am slowing down because I'm approaching zero meters per second. That's one way that you can think about this. The other way that you can look at this is that you can look at it in terms of sine. Okay? So I'm down here, so I have negative velocity. That line is sloping up and to the right, so therefore I have positive acceleration. So anytime your velocity and acceleration have opposite signs, there's no exceptions to this rule whatsoever. None, zero, zip, no, excel, no exceptions. If you're slowing down, your velocity and acceleration have to have opposite signs. There's no exceptions to that rule, none, zero, zip. Now, after it crosses zero meters per second, I still have positive acceleration, but now what's the sign of my velocity? positive. I've changed direction and now I'm speeding up. So I can slow down and speed up with uniform acceleration. That's what's happening right there. Okay. So I can slow down, speed up with uniform acceleration. I take this ball, I throw it up in the air. Okay. Gravity is the quintessential example of uniform acceleration. So gravity makes that ball slow down on the way up and then gravity makes that ball speed back up on the way down, okay? So, again, on the test, if I ask you for acceleration, just don't look for the regions where it's speeding up. Any acceleration is going to be a change in the velocity. You just have to decide, is that acceleration making it speed up or is it making it slow down? Okay. So, on the yellow sheet, a whole bunch of questions. Here is the white. This sheet has the answer keys to this, okay? So, oddly enough, one of the things I want to make you do, if you look like on uh, this question, I said, what is the velocity at two seconds? What is the velocity at five seconds? So, at five seconds, this is where you have a curved line, okay? This is where I'd expect you to draw a tangent line. I say, what is the average velocity in the first five seconds? Oh, average velocity in the first five seconds. I'm going to take my final position minus my initial position and divide that by five seconds. Okay? So when you get to this one, what is the result of a 30 newton force at 15 degrees and a 40 newton, newton, 40 newton force at 120? So if you look on this sheet, this is where this last problem is worked out. Here's this big chart. So what I would do if I were you all, if I were taking this test on Monday, what I would do is I would take this and a big dog equation sheet and a protractor and a ruler, and that's all I would do. And I would try and work this, okay? This is going to tell you an idea of how well you're prepared for the test, okay? Then grade it. Here's the answer key. Great. Now, if you get to a question and you have no idea how to start it, then give mine a look. Go, ah, how do we do it? But what you don't want to do is read the question and then look at my answers. Okay? Bad. Don't do that. Because you're right away you're biased. It's like, oh, here's the first question. Uh, can an object change direction? And then you read my answer and it's like, oh, man, Burkamp got that right. He's, oh, that's good. Okay. And then you read the second question, and then you read mine, and say, oh, that's exactly how I would have answered it. Burkham's on a roll. He's got this. Okay? No, don't. Okay? Don't look at my stuff until you've tried to answer it. I'm just telling you. Now, you also have everything back. Every assignment, every lab, everything has been returned to you. This has to become practice. Okay? You know you're going to have vectors where you're going to have to draw them out with a protractor and a ruler. 
Okay, you have an entire assignment that I just gave back to you. Start a group chat, start a group document. Somebody say, hey, somebody make up some vectors and let's try and work it. Okay, or make up your own problems. Take my numbers and change them. You know you're going to have, when you get done, you know you're going to have to work a big problem where you have vectors that you have to break it up into segments. Okay, there's one like this on the review. You've got that assignment. Change the numbers. Play the what if game and go, oh, what if I change that to from a 40 degree angle to a 60 degree angle? And think through what ramifications that would have. Play the what if game, okay? Ask yourself, you all have been in school for about 12 years now. Write your own tests. Go, wow, if I were writing the test, what would I do? How would I write a question over vectors? How would I write a, velocity, a question over position time graphs? over velocity time graphs? Would I write it as a true-false question? Would I write it as a multiple-choice question? Would I write it as a big question that I have to work out? Okay? Those are the things that you need to think through. So you have everything back. It's all been corrected. If there are problems that you missed, wow, maybe that's something that I need to work on. Okay? Just words of advice. All right, I am done. Uh, the, the other piece of paper that you're going to get is this. Here are the things that you need to know for the test, okay? Scalar versus vector quantities. I promise you, I'm going to ask you, what's the difference between a vector quantity and a scalar quantity? I'm going to ask you that question, okay? Going, that's the question it's going to be. What's the difference between a vector quantity and a scalar quantity? And you need to say, oh, vector quantities that have magnitude and direction, scalar quantities only have magnitude. I'm going to ask you that question. I promise you, okay? What does, it, what does constant velocity look like on a position time graph? What does it look like on a velocity time graph? If an object changes direction, what does it have to do? Okay. Anyway, so uh, that's my words of advice. I'm done. You have the rest of the time to do this. And here we go.